Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome at the Radboud University for the third Edward Schillebeek's lecture, organized by Radboud Reflex in association with Tijdschrift for Theologie and the Edward Schillebeek Foundation. My name is um, Gerard Meyer, and I'm not only an alumnus of this university, but since almost four years, I'm also happy to be president of this beautiful university. Schillebeek's was, and still is, a source of inspiration for many academics. His fascinating lecture style and the way he approached unusual and delicate topics were his two defining characteristics. He had the courage to take a stand and take responsibility in his own research and analysis, even if it meant going against the grain. The quality of his work is still relevant to this day. To quote the former dean, Ben Vedder, the strength of his text cannot be exhausted by a single reading. They can be read again and again, thanks to the richness they contain. That is the hallmark of all great works intended as source text, text that stand the test of time by being read and reread. That is our job as theologians. End of his quote. Last week, this university celebrated its 93rd anniversary, and the team of the academic ceremony, and actually of the whole week, was the challenge of chance. Professor Ellen van Wolde finished her dies rede, her anniversary address, as follows. Chance unmasks the mortal sin of extrapolation, in which a single idea or theory is used as a model for explaining everything. It is the ultimate unmasker of all our certainties. End of her quote. It is certainly not by chance that the Edward Schillebeek's lecture is given by a prominent and controversial thinker on a subject that played a role in the work of Nijmegen's most famous theologian. On the contrary, the first lecture in 2011 was given by, by former master of the Dominican order, Professor Timothy Radcliffe, Oxford University. The second lecture was given by former Archbishop of Canterbury, and since 2014, also honorary doctor of this university, Sir Rowan Williams. Today's speaker is widely regarded as Britain's most influential living literary critic and philo philosopher, and one of the world's greatest cultural theor theorists, Terry Eagleton. And we're very honored to have you as our guest today, and we we'll look forward to your lecture. And as a welcome present, I would like to offer you the book that I um, just briefly mentioned, the book edited by my colleagues Klaas Lansman and Ella van Bolde, and that came out last week, and it's entitled The Challenge of Change. And as I said, the whole last week, that was the team, and uh, that is when this book came out. But first, I would like to give the floor to Professor of Fundamental Theology at the KU Leuven, Stefan van Erp, who will guide you through today's program. And I wish you all a very pleasant and inspiring evening, and I'll come forward and, um, and hand you this, um, this book. Also from me, a very warm welcome to you all. Thank you for coming to the uh, third Edward Schillebeek lecture, which is, as Gerard Meyer already said, a biennial event organized by Tijdschrift voor Theologie and Radboud Reflects, with the support of the Edward Schillebeek Foundation and the Dutch Dominicans. This series of lectures started in 2011 with Timothy Radcliffe on theology and the imagination and continued in 2013 with Rowan Williams on theology and language. And as 
Gerard Meyer already said a few months after his Schillebeek's lecture, Williams received an honorary doctorate from this university in 2014. Now, Terry, this is not a promise on the contrary. Now, these lectures are concerned with themes on the interface of theology and culture, both domains and instruments, often somehow intertwined, of a critique of the present and a presentation of the future. And tonight, I'm very honored to introduce to you Terry Eagleton, who is a distinguished professor of English literature at the University of Lancaster. He's a well-known literary scholar, cultural theorist with Irish Catholic roots, which, as he would later describe it, lacked, lacked all instinctive feel for the liberal sensibility. He studied in Cambridge, in which, as he wrote, one could move fairly freely from Catholicism to Marxism. And throughout his life, he has argued the merit, merits of a populist Marxism as an alternative to postmodern theory and institutional Christianity. He's a public intellectual who writes for The Guardian and The New Statesman, and he gained prominence for his trenchant criticism of the new atheism as naive and of the highly intellectualized postmodernist theory as bankrupt. Born in 1943, Eagleton earned his Cambridge doctorate as a student of the left-wing literary critic Raymond Williams. He became a fellow of Jesus College, Cambridge, the youngest since the 18th century, and then moved to Wadham College at Oxford University in 1968. He began by specializing in Victorian literature, such as the works of Charles Dickens, but ranged widely into both Shakespeare and modern literature, and into the rise of the new literary theory among French intellectuals who advocated a postmodernist viewpoint. And he wrote a few now, I think, classics in literary theory, among which his 1976 book, Criticism and Ideology, a study in Marxist literary theory. At Oxford University, Eagleton was the Thomas Wharton Professor of English Literature from 1992 to 2001, and then became John Edward Taylor Professor of English Literature at the University of Manchester. In 2008, he became what he is until this day, Professor of English Literature at the University of Lancaster in Northern England, and he also took the post of Professor of Cultural Theory at the National University of Ireland in Galway. And I think, if I'm correct, he still lives in Ireland. He has held visiting appointments at a number of universities around the world, including Cornell, Duke, Iowa, Melbourne, Notre Dame, Trinity College Dublin, and Yale University. And he's also a fellow of the British Academy and the English Association. Now, although calling himself an atheist at the time, Eagleton joined the new atheism debates of the 21st century with his 2009 book, Reason, Faith and Revolution, by criticizing the naive atheism typified by the writer Christopher Hitchens and scientist Richard Dawkins, famously grouping them together as Ditchkins. Against their secular naivety and against the economic consequences of liberalism, Eagleton has argued that the social and ethical teachings of Jesus could be seen as exemplary. In his 2011 book, Why Marx Was Right, he claims that Marx's basic analysis was correct, correct but has been corrupted, simplified, and co-opted just as institutional Christianity corrupted the ethics of its founder. Eagleton is known for a clear and often hilarious literary style that has often made his surveys of dense theoretical issues highly readable. He writes faster than his shadow, has written more than 50 books, and I've been told he is commissioned to publish at least one per year in the years to come. Now, in the last few weeks, I have had a wonderful time 
reading his articles and books, and I can recommend them to you all if you're looking for some joy and happiness, or at least a few good laughs. Now, that does not mean Eagleton will not present you with his annoyances and grievances, most of which I wholeheartedly share, especially since he, surprising as it may be, is engaging with theology in the last decade or so, especially with its critics, but also with the lame and half-baked versions of postmodern and liberal theological underpinnings of the Christian faith. And I give you a few examples. On Alain de Botton and his school of life, for example, he writes, the Botton claims that one can be an atheist while still finding religion sporadically useful, interesting and consoling, which makes it sound rather like knocking up a bookcase when you're feeling a bit low. This is not quite the gospel of a preacher who was tortured and executed for speaking up for justice and who warned his comrades that if they followed his example, they would meet with the same fate. In the Botton's well-manicured hands, Eagleton's words, this bloody business becomes a soothing form of spiritual therapy able to promote morality and engender a spirit of community. End of quote. Which could equally be employed for certain types of contemporary theology. Eagleton, once a Catholic and then a self-declared atheist himself, has become, as I would describe it, a friend of Christianity. But he might prove me wrong in recent years, or perhaps even more, although he's never quite explicit about his own faith. But there are traces of commitment somehow. When the people of the Occupy movement put up their camp before St. Paul's Cathedral in London, he wrote, under capitalist conditions, Marx thought men and women cease to see themselves reflected in the work of their own hands. Jesus was not an anti-capitalist any more than Dante was a Darwinist, but he was ready to risk death in order to defend what he saw as an authentic form of giving against a system that impoverished it. And as such, he would probably have understood what those currently shivering outside St. Paul's are up to. They have certainly managed to throw the ruling caste, there goes my iPad, the ruling caste of a holy place into an unholy panic, just as he did. And to that extent, they are his followers, however much some of them may now understandably despise religion. And Eagleton was also surprisingly mild about Pope Francis' last book when he wrote, whatever the ambiguities of his past, he emerges as a man, this is Pope Francis, of remarkable kindliness and humanity, which is more than can be said of a fair number of his predecessors. And Eagleton has been vicious about John Paul II. Jesus sends forth his disciples, Francis Commons, not as holders of power or as masters of the law. He sends them forth into the world, asking them to live in the logic of love and selflessness by embracing the outcast, the marginalized, and the sinner. And then Terry writes, standard stuff in one sense, yet at a David Trump rally, it might just be enough to get you punched in the face. Terry, we are delighted that you are here in Nijmegen. You once wrote that you began your intellectual career as an amateur species of theologian in those heady post-Second Vatican Council days in the 1960s, in which, as you write, anyone able to spell the name Schillebeeks was instantly drafted onto the editorial board of some opaque journal based in Nijmegen. Well, here you are. You are not here because you're able to spell Schillebeek's name, which, is, which I'm sure you can, but you're here to tell us about your vision 
of what happened with faith in our recent history. A nightmare, perhaps, but you might show us ways of dreaming our history that allows us to wake up or to give us some insights of the paradox that Christianity offers us. In the words of your friend Herbert McCabe, if you don't love, you're dead, and if you do love, you'll be killed. It is that tragedy of salvation as a glimpse of the future that Edward Schillebeek's devoted his theology to, and I'm sure there will be something of that very same tragedy with some humor in what you have to say to us. Welcome in name, Eger. I would now like to give the floor to you. Well, I'm sorry to interrupt the music. They all seem to disappear as soon as I, as I arrived. Um, and thank you very much for those charming words, which I assure you I didn't write, actually. This is one of the rare occasions when I don't write my own introductions. I usually just hand it to the person introducing me, you know, full of praise for myself. Uh, the only thing I would slightly take issue with, I don't think I ever declared myself to be an atheist. Um, Anyway, I'm delighted to be back in, to be, well, yes, this is my first visit, I think, to Nijmegen, um, and to be lecturing in the name of one of the most distinguished <coughs> theologians of the modern age. I was brought up in a Dominican parish. I've been associating with Dominicans all my life. My eldest son is called Dominic, and one of my other close Dominican friends, a man called Cornelius Ernst, um, once remarked that of all the as it were, fashionable new theologians around the time of Vatican II, he thought Skillebix was the man whose work, I don't think he knew him, but was most marked by a personal charity and humility, which always struck me as interesting that Cornelius had somehow detected that in the work of Skillebix. Atheism is by no means as easy as it looks, or rather, um, it's easy enough, it's perhaps too easy at the, at the individual level, but far from easy at the level of a whole civilization. Too easy at the individual level, why? Because in my experience, most atheists and agnostics um, buy their non-belief on the cheap. That's to say that they have great fun in bowling over straw men that no self-respecting theologian would agree with in the first place. Yes? And you can play that game for a long time. Um, take, for example, that man whose name I always forget, but whose wife used to act in Doctor Who on television. Uh, Dawkins, yes, sorry, sorry, <laughs> Dawkins. His wife, that's the only thing I know about him. His wife used to act in Doctor Who. Um, Dawkins actually believes, and so does my old pal Chris Hitchens, with whom I used to distribute Trotsky's leaflets outside in Oxford, car factory longer ago than I care to remember, they both believe that, for, just to take an example, that the doctrine of creation has something to do with how the world got started, yes? And therefore, of course, that man whose wife is in Doctor Who used, uh, rejects it because, um, you know, it's a kind of bogus science. I hope a first-year theology student would know that the doctrine of creation has nothing to do with how the world got started. Absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with it. If you want to know what it really has to do with, then if you approach me in private after this session for a very modest fee, I'll let you know. So, as far as individual atheism goes, it's often not philosophically very interesting because it consists in knocking over targets that, you know, as I say, decent theologians don't agree with in the first place. And the responsibility for that, of course, lies with the churches, lies with the caricatured you know, notions of the gospel, which so many of the churches have peddled for so long. But my point is that atheism at the level of a whole society, of a whole civilization, is a far diff diff different thing, much harder. Um, uh, in fact, you could write the history of modernity, really, in terms of all of the various failed surrogates for the almighty. Yes, you could write modernity in terms of 
all of these busted models, you know, the rubble of, subst of failed substitutes for God, all the way from reason, geist, art, science, culture, humanity, to nature, the people, the nation, the state, and Adele. You're supposed to laugh at that, but it, you know it, it's uh, you haven't warmed up properly. You know, um, I, I say um, I, I mention Adele just just so you don't think I'm some kind of stuffy intellectual, um, but you know I'm a real human being. You know, just please don't see me just as some cerebral intellectual. He sobbed. Um, but the point is that no sooner has God been kicked out the front door than some substitute for him often heavily in disguise, as it were, is wheeled in the back door, one of these substitutes or others, and nothing very much has changed in the process. I don't, of course, mean that all the phenomena I just listed are nothing but stand-ins for God, but uh, all of them have fulfilled such a function at various times in their career, and I think the point is that religion has traditionally played so vital a role in legitimating political regimes, that our rulers could hardly look upon the so-called disappearance of God with any degree of equanimity, which is one of several reasons why there have been various largely doomed attempts to fill his shoes. I say largely doomed because religion is an exceedingly hard act to follow. It has in fact proved to be, whatever you think about it, whether you despise it or delight in it, the single most tenacious, enduring, widespread, deep-seated, symbolic system humanity has ever known. Not least, I think, because almost uniquely it's able to connect the everyday customs and practices of billions upon billions of people with the most august, transcendent, imperishable truth. That's a very rare sort of relationship. It's, it's the most successful form of popular culture in history, though I bet you won't find it on a single cultural studies course. Culture can mean the values and beliefs of a cultivated minority, in as it were the specialist aesthetic sense, or in a broader, more anthropological sense, it can of course mean a whole way of life, it can mean language, symbol, nation, ethnicity, history, customs. And in a word, not least in our day, culture is what you are prepared to kill for or die for. Culture, in that broad sense, is most certainly what people, men and women, are prepared to lay down their lives for. Nobody that I know is prepared to kill for Balzac or Beethoven except perhaps for a few weird people hiding out in caves somewhere, too shamefaced to come out and face the rest of us. But culture as language, system, belief, genealogy, kinship, and so on, it has widely held to be well worth giving up one's life for. It's as important as that, though as I'll say at the end of this talk, I don't think even so that culture is ultimately where it's at. I don't think with the culturalists that culture goes all the way down. Now, if you think of those two meanings of culture, roughly the aesthetic specialised one and the anthropological one, only really religion has been able to make organic connections between the two. Uniting priest and laity, intellectual and populace, idea and institution, metaphysical speculation and popular piety, ritual and social reality, in ways that any other symbolic system is bound to turn green with envy at. Yes? Today, of course, the most successful substitute for religion, the last in that long and distinguished line from, you know, Geist and nature to the state and so on, is, of course, sport. Sport is the opium of the people, not religion. You might even call it the crack of the people. Um, it's sport which lays on the weekly liturgies, the sense of symbolic solidarity, the lineages of distinguished figures or saints, as it were, provides people with the sense of community, which was once perhaps found in a chapel 
or a, or a cathedral. Just imagine what would happen politically if you abolished it. I think it would be one's first move as a socialist government would be to abolish sport. You'd have to do that. Sorry, but you know, I'm sure there are some United supporters, but I'm sorry. Now, we now arrive at the first of a series of extraordinary subtle and ingenious ironies around which this paper is organised. That was meant to be ironic itself, but there we are. Um, after a whole series of botched and bungled attempts to dislodge the Almighty from his throne uh, and replace him with suitably, some suitably secularised version of himself, after a whole series of doomed attempts of that kind, a sector of European civilization in our own time finally succeeded in dispatching him to the outer darkness. Not, as it happens, with Nietzsche's defiant, ecstatic announcement of the death of God, but about a century later, when capitalism had moved, when the same social system had moved to its more advanced postmodern stage, when, as it were, capitalist society had changed in our own time to the point where now Nietzsche's clarion call could be successfully heeded. It couldn't be in his own day because when a class, when the bourgeoisie uh, is still emergent and consolidating itself, it very, as it was at Nietzsche's time, it very often needs some grand narratives to recount to itself. It can't and doesn't want to get by simply with a kind of modest pragmatism. It, it, it deals with some fairly large ideological motifs, reason, geist, science, progress, humanity, and so on. Once, however, that class, that civilization, once middle-class Europe settles down to the rather more mundane business of making profit, it can afford to go faithless, it can afford to ditch those grand narratives, and indeed will profit from doing so. I mean profit spiritually and ideologically, because faith, whether religious or otherwise, is a divisive, controversial affair, not good for social cohesion which is what our rulers want, and in any case, a consistency of self and belief doesn't really fit very well with the volatile, adaptive, diffuse, decentered, eternally mutable human subject of postmodernism or late capitalism. Indeed, postmodern theory um, makes the disastrous mistake of regarding conviction as both as incipiently, at least, dogmatic and authoritarian. Would you believe it? That we have arrived at a point where conviction itself is treated with suspicion. Start off with a belief in goblins, and you'll end it up with a belief in the gulag. Yes? And this fear of dogmatism is, of course, the reason why so many young people today say, like, every four seconds. Um, you know, it's nine o'clock sounds unpleasantly... Uh, absolute and definitive and authoritarian, but you know, it's like nine o'clock is suitably revisionist, provisional, open ended, tentative, exploratory, and all of those other great postmodern virtues. Yes. Um, when he was recently asked whether he had any convictions, the mayor of London, or the previous mayor of London, John, Boris Johnson, replied that he thought he'd picked up one or two for driving offences early in his. Career, yes. Now, I should add, add, of course, immediately, in an eminently dialectical fashion, that um, the faithlessness of late modernity is also, of course, an enormous gain. One has, just as Marx thinks that capitalism is at once the most thrall enthralling emancipation and revolutionary movement history has ever witnessed, Read the Communist Manifesto if you want the most embarrassingly effuse and lavish praise of capitalism and at the same time believes it's been one long nightmare and that those two things are as close as two sides of paper, the same sheet of paper, yes. In the same way, of course, this faithlessness, this secularization, whatever you want to call it, has been uh, an enormous, a signal gain. Um, there are three areas it w it, which you might call in society the, the, symbolic, uh, the symbolic dimension. Um, religion, much the most important. 
Sexuality, the next important, and art, not very important. But, you know, just. What happens, of course, to cut a long story short, in the course of modernity, is that all three of them become privatised, yeah? um, become, as it were, nobody's business but your own. And that, of course, is, as they say, in one sense, an extraordinary Again, you know, the purity police are now not likely to break down your bedroom door at two o'clock in the morning, for example, which is always very disturbing, and that's a great gain. I've been through it many times myself, yes. Um, uh, art, you know, becomes privatised. Artists begin to moan and wail about being dysfunctional and living in garrets and ivory towers and various things like that. And, of course, religion becomes Protestantism, in a way, just a matter between you and God, basically. Um, so all of that, you know, in a sense, all of these things become much more like hobbies, you know, like, you know, breeding rabbits, for example, you know, not the kind of thing that you go to the stake for uh, or, get, or get crucified for, yeah? Um, so what we have is, on the one hand, a welcome, a gratifying emancipation from an oppressive pre-modern situation of state power and a withering of the social sense, so that none of these things really is as important, as invested uh, with, with energy as people used to think. So, my, my point is really that advanced or postmodern capitalism can afford to go relativist, pragmatic, uh, post-metaphysical, anti-foundational, post-absolutist, post-theological, even post-historical, as the same regime couldn't so easily do at all in its heyday. Uh, belief isn't what holds our civilizations together at all, as it's what holds you know, the Lutheran Church or, or the Boy Scout movement together. Speaking of the Boy Scout movement, as I often find myself doing for no particular reason, um, I was just writing a paper about how atrocious some of uh, our ancestors were, and I was describing in awful graphic detail the terrible things they did to St. George, you know, roasted him and sawed him in half. And even the CIA don't do that. You know, they don't saw people. Well, they don't need to, really. They have much more sophisticated means of torture. Uh, and then, to crown his indignities, he was made patron of the Boy Scout movement. Yes. He didn't have much luck, old St. George. Um, belief isn't what holds this society, this kind of society together. Belief is, uh, I mean, too much belief is neither necessary nor desirable for advanced capitalist orders. Um, it's politically dangerous, as I say, it's potentially divisive, and it's commercially superfluous. As long as the citizens row out of bed and go to work and don't beat up too many police officers, they can believe anything they want, which is an absolutely extraordinary situation of a liberal uh, society, which any uh, pre-modern, you know, ancient or feudalist ideologue would no doubt have found absolutely extraordinary. Or at least you can believe anything you want as long as it doesn't undermine the situation in which anybody can believe anything they want, if you see what I mean. Um, that would have been traditionally viewed with utter amusement. Um, and of course there are, that's as I say, an extraordinary gain and also because belief isn't really that important. So what? Um, in the eyes of Nietzsche, who I think is, as it were, the grandfather of postmodernism, truly noble spirits refuse to be the prisoners of their own convictions. Instead, they treat their own most cherished opinions with a certain sort of cavalier detachment, adopting and discarding them at will. Oscar Wilde, who was a kind of Nietzschean, used to do this. One's beliefs are more like one's manservants, you know, to be hired and fired as the fancy takes you, than like your bodily organs. Contrast that with the philosopher Charles Taylor's insistence that belief is actually constitutive of selfhood. You know, what it is to have an identity is, however unconsciously, to have certain commitments and convictions and orientations. There's no selfhood without that, though the convictions in question don't, of course, need to be absolute, whatever that means. The left-wing historian A.J.P. Taylor once informed the committee interviewing him for an Oxford fellowship that he had some extreme political views but held them moderately. <laughs> he got the fellowship. 
Of course, you might still need some kind of metaphysical, some rather grand-sounding discourse, standing by, as it were, not least at points of political crisis, to help legitimate what it is you get up to. Otherwise, however, one hopes that doesn't need, one doesn't need to have recourse to that, because one's in trouble if one does. Otherwise, it's a matter of endorsing the view of the wit who remarked that when religion begins to interfere with your everyday life, it's time to give it up. Jesus, unfortunately, didn't, didn't acknowledge that at all. It's rather like alcohol in that sense. You know, it's all very well at the odd weekend, you know, but you don't want to overdo it. You know. don't want, you know, it starts you know, actually living it out in every day, you know, something you must be a fanatic of some kind. Um, what I think Nietzsche was the first to see it was not that God was dead, which is in a sense a fairly traditional theme, that God was dead on his feet, as it were, but he was the first to identify the perpetrator of that murder. And it wasn't some bunch of you know, long-haired, lefty atheists in blue denim suits and sideburns, as we all used to have in the 1970s. Yes? It was the stout bourgeois himself who had done his own God in, in yet another ingenious irony which surreptitiously organizes this talk. Um, it was the inherently rationalist, instrumental, pragmatic, utilitarian logic of market society that had rendered its own high-sounding metaphysical rationales so implausible. This society was, as it were, digging its own grave, ideologically speaking, um, or in more Marxist terms, I suppose, the material base of middle-class society was embarrassingly at odds with its ideological superstructure. There was a hiatus or contradiction between the two. And the faithlessness, the kind of faithlessness I'm talking of is one it's not so much a matter of people's belief or non-belief, it's actually built into the routine practices of market capitalism. Uh, the market will continue to behave faithlessly even if every one of its members was a born-again evangelical. So the stout bourgeois is at the same time a true believer in his church or in the bosom of his family and a rank atheist in his office or counting house. And it was he himself, Nietzsche perceived, with enormous originality, I think, who was doing himself ideologically out of business. God was dead, but though many people didn't believe in him anymore because of the rationalized and secularized world they'd created, they didn't really know that they didn't believe in him. They didn't believe in him, but they didn't know that they didn't. And Nietzsche thought that was a form of rank social hypocrisy and, as it were, tried to blow the whistle on it. They were caught, if you like, in a state of cognitive dissonance, you know, believing and disbelieving simultaneously in the way that Othello thinks that Desdemona is unfaithful to him and thinks she isn't unfaithful to him. Not that he thinks one thing at one moment or the next thing the next, but he thinks both things simultaneously. So it was necessary to pretend or convince yourself in an enormous act of, as it were, mauvaise foi, or self-systematic self-deception, that God was still alive. Keep him, as it were, on a life support machine. Why? Well, because it was, I think, mistakenly believed that he provided the underpinnings of bourgeois morality, which in turn was a vital foundation of middle-class power. So you had a little sort of hierarchy, and if you kicked away the metaphysical base, the rest of it, it was thought, uh, would come tumbling down. Actually, that wasn't, turned out not to be the case. So, like uh, Norman Bates in Psycho, the middle class, consumed by Mauvissois, had to deny their own act of deicide, their own murder, you know, frantically cleaning up the scene of the crime, and quite convinced, like Norman, but he hadn't do it. I mentioned Psycho once again to remind you I'm not just some cerebral intellectual, but I do actually have a human life to lead. Um, so, put it this way, though the economy was a rank atheist, the state which stood guard over it needed 
uh, you know, some to be in some sense a true believer, if not theologically, then in some sense metaphysically. And the two of them can't help entering into an embarrassing uh, conflict with one another, which you just have to manage, as it were, as best you can. And Nietzsche's own solution to this was hair-raisingly radical. It was just, you know, if the metaphysical superstructure doesn't work any longer, if people are not grabbed by faith, if the working class are becoming atheistic and so on, then just throw it away. You know, recognize that you don't need it anymore, like the baby or the infant who thinks that it needs to keep sucking at the blanket. But the most dramatic thing that happens when you take it away is that nothing happens and it realizes it doesn't need to. Um, if you know, if you keep subverting the metaphysical structure by your own profane activity, um, then just accept that God is dead, that the superstructure, that that superstructure does not work anymore, and seize advantage of God's absence to manufacture your own values in the manner of the Übermensch. This was far too radical a proposal for Nietzsche's own time, where grand narratives of one kind or another, as I say, were still the order of the day, but it became more feasible in our time. It became more feasible as roughly the same social system evolved into a later phase. In fact, you might describe post-modernity, perhaps a little rashly, as the first thoroughly atheistic civilization. Uh, not that post-modernity ever covered a whole civilization. I mean, you know, Western civilization is made up of all kinds of different cultures which are not all postmodern, but it's, a, it's been a very dominant form of culture, abandoning not only grand narratives and foundations and transcendental signifiers and absolute values and the like, but even in a certain sense, abandoning subjectivity itself, at least the kind of deep subjectivity in which, which would require, um, in which faith might germinate which you would require in order for some kind of faith to take root. And what then, just as we got to that point, what was the next enormous irony to happen? Two aircraft slammed into the World Trade Center. Just at the time when Western ideologues everywhere were declaring the end of history, the end of foundations, the end of grand narratives, the end of metaphysics, and a whole new full-bloodedly metaphysical grand narrative uh, was launched, the so-called War on Terror, was launched with a fanfare. Just the point, as I say, where the West, giddy with its triumphalistic success in the wake of the Cold War, an enormously important point, I think, had declared all that grand, grandiose stuff to be over and done with. Once the Cold War was won, so some apologists considered, the West no longer stood in need of ardent convictions, fundamental truths, grand narratives, sizable doctrinal systems, which were anyway not convenient, as I said before, because they didn't fit, they didn't fit well into the post-ideological climate of advanced capitalism. The exception here, of course, as always, is the United States, one of the most materialistic civilizations in history, but simultaneously one of the most metaphysical. It's an extraordinary conjuncture, utterly different from pagan Europe, yes? Um, I mean, American politicians really have to talk about God and the family and this great nation of ours and our brave men and women in uniform and so on, which you couldn't really get away with in the more cynical, hard-boiled milieu of Paris or London where people would simply stare at their shoes and wait for it to stop, as I do myself when Schoenberg comes on the radio. But America is in that sense exceptional. I mean, you may, of course, think this is just a standard, you know, leftist anti-Americanism, which it is indeed. Um, but some of my best friends are Americans. Yeah. My wife, for example. And I think three of my children, I can't, never quite remember how many children I have, but certainly three of them, I think, are card-carrying Americans, or at least passport-carrying 
Americans. Anyway, the irony is obvious, you see that. No sooner had a thoroughly atheistic culture, not a whole civilization, because modernism was never that, but a very entrenched and dominant and influential culture, arrived on the scene, uh, which was no longer, unlike high modernism, was no longer haunted by any sense of angst or lack or lock or loss or instability. Postmodernism itself, high modernism, is plagued by a sense that there's something just out of the corner of its eye, some ghost of truth or some ghost of reality or foundations, but which, as in the wasteland, when you look straight at it, it disappears. Postmodernism thinks that's mere illusion. It's too young, so to speak, to remember a time when there supposedly was truth, identity, self-ordered reality, and thinks, as Richard Rorty famously put it, you know, that you shouldn't scratch where it doesn't itch. Yes? Just forget about those things. You know, stop being haunted by those unquiet ghosts from the past. Postmodernism also uh, tends to think that marginality is ipso facto positive, which is utterly ridiculous, of course. Neo-Nazis are marginal, and long may they remain so, and praises difference, plurality, diversity, and inclusiveness without being old enough to remember, if you like, that those were not what brought down apartheid, and those were not the virtues that brought down the former Soviet Union, but solidarity, which postmodernism falsely equates with uniformity or homogeneity. But I mustn't stray into an elderly rant against postmodernism. I've done so so many times before. Anyway, the irony was that no sooner had that uh, atheistic culture arrived on the scene, one that was no longer anxiously in search of some placeholder for God, you know, which no longer looked anxiously for a substitution or a surrogate, than God himself was suddenly back on the agenda with a vengeance. But this time, not, not a God on the side of civilization, not a suitably, you know, golf-playing, short-haired, blue-blazered, white-collar God, but a God who had shifted over to the side of so-called barbarism, a wrathful, alien, brown-skinned deity. The Almighty, it appeared, was not, after all, safely nailed down in his coffin. He'd simply shifted address to the hills of Montana and the souks of the Arab world. And despite his premature obituary notice, his fan club was steadily growing, not least in Latin America's evangelization. Fundamentalism, whether, whether Texan or Taliban, has its source in anxiety rather than in hatred, which is, I suppose, in a sense, the good news. It's the pathological mindset of those who feel washed up and humiliated by the brave new world of advanced capitalism, who don't fit into its framework, and who might therefore conclude that the only way of drawing attention to their undervalued existence uh, is to blow the heads off small children in the name of Allah, or blow up play schools in Oklahoma City. What had happened, in other words, was that smaller, weaker nations that had suffered under the West's new post-Cold War triumphalism finally unleashed a, backla a backlash in the form of radical Islam. And that meant, in yet another irony, that the closing down of one grand narrative, the so-called end of history, the end of the Cold War, capitalism was now the only game in town and would be ad infinitum, actually served, would you believe it, to open up another, the so-called war on terror. No sooner had the first grand narrative been put to bed than for reasons which as I'll try to explain were closely connected with the end of that first grand narrative actually prized open a second, it was not for the first time to be sure uh, that a declaration of the end of history had proved a little premature. Hegel uh, believed with endearing modesty that history had now culminated inside his own head. Yes. Um, but this claim only generated more history in the sense of a whole series of vigorous attempts to rebut that, you know, from Kierkegaard to Adorno or whatever. 
the act of blowing the whistle on history and trying to call the whole thing off is itself, of course, a historical act and therefore simply succeeds in adding to the history that it's trying to abolish. It's a self-refuting act. Much the same is true of the early 20th century revolutionary artistic avant-garde, still by far the most revolutionary development of our age, who in seeking to eradicate all previous history and create a kind of empty space of their, for their own utterly original innovation, simply succeeded in heaping a little more history on what was there already. The next irony of the whole affair, I think, was that the liberal agnostic West had actually succeeded, had a hand in bringing this illiberal theocratic antagonist, radical Islam, into existence. And that it still, it still refuses, uh, in Prospero's words about Caliban at the end of the Tempest, to acknowledge this thing of darkness as, at least in part, its own. Yes. The moment on the threshold in tragedy, the moment when Oedipus appears at Colonus, is the moment when this disshapen, crippled, blinded, polluted, raging fury on one's doorstep has to be dealt with in some way or another. And Theseus in Oedipus at Colonus, in fear and trembling that this will pollute the whole city, welcomes the stranger in. And of course, as with all such welcoming of the pharmacos or scapegoat, the result is the release of an enormous power for good. But that requires an enormous act of not only courage, but repentance. That's to say, the polis recognizing its own distorted and corrupt visage in this beggarly figure who is haunting it. This, of course, the West still is far too self-repressed at the moment to do. It won't acknowledge this thing of darkness as its own. An agnosticism actually designed to ward off so-called fanaticism succeeded in stoking it by its own predatory foreign policies. So that the West helped not only to spawn secularism, but fundamentalism as well, a most creditable feat of dialectics. What I mean by that is just this, that in the earlier decades of the 20th century, the rolling back of liberal, secular, left nationalist forces in the Muslim world by the West for its own imperial purposes. Don't forget the West, the CIA, supported the massacre of half a million leftists in Indonesia in the 1950s. That concerted onslaught upon, as it were, the more progressive and enlightened forces in the Muslim, however ambiguously, in the Muslim world, created a political vacuum into which radical Islam was then able to move in, in that vital of all, most vital of all geopolitical regions, though you won't hear much about that on Fox News. Jihad is to some extent, not entirely, not entirely, uh, and it has some genuinely fascistic and ugly roots, but it's to some extent the bastard offspring of the very civilization it's out to annihilate. So what we have, what we end up with, is a world divided somewhere down the middle between people who believe too much, you know, fundamentalists of various stripes, and people who believe too little, you know, chief executives, technocrats, Robbie Williams, and so on. Or to paraphrase my national poet, there are some who lack all conviction and others who are full of passionate intensity. And the point is that each keeps bouncing off the other in a kind of stalled or frozen dialectic. It's not just, you know, on the one hand and on the other hand, as the good middle-class liberal likes to put it, it's that these are part, these are a conflicting part of the same situation. Um, I don't know, I won't bother that. Um, however, when it comes to belief, the West is at a signal disadvantage, since the next irony is that, or another way of looking at the whole ironic situation, I suppose, is that it, it engaged um, in a kind of ideological self-disarmament in its post-Cold War years, imagining that it could get by on a mixture of pragmatism, scepticism, relativism, anti-foundationalism, secularism and the like, 
just at the moment, would you believe it, when it was confronted by a new full-bloodedly absolutist, foundationalist, metaphysical antagonist. Uh, I mean, it's true that the West formally, at least, continues to believe in God and freedom and democracy and so on. It's just that those convictions have to survive in a cultural climate, a climate of scepticism which gravely debilitates them, which is not, on the whole, the case in the Muslim world. The West, if you like, is caught in what the linguisticians might call a performative contradiction between what it does and what it says it does, the way it explains or interprets what it does to itself. Um, and of course, if you really want to know what somebody believes, you don't listen to what they say particularly, you look at what they do. You look at the beliefs embodied in their actual daily practice. And it's thus that men and women may not, as they say, actually believe in God, but they imagine still that they do. There is no way uh, in which Donald Trump can believe in God. Absolutely no way. It doesn't matter what he thinks he believes, and it certainly doesn't matter what he says he believes. Look at his behaviour, and if he does believe in God, that God is worthless. Because the only good God for Christianity is a dead one, dead and risen one, and there is no death in Donald Trump's world. It would be absurd to imagine that the world of Donald Trump could accommodate death or mortality or frailty or finitude or any of the great themes of tragedy for which, without trying to stare that gorgon's head in the face, per impossible, there is no hope of redemption. For tragedy, you must be undone in order to be remade and there's absolutely no guarantee that it's going to work and if you have as it were your trump card excuse the pun up your sleeve you know then it certainly won't work um, forgive me if you're at my seminar this morning because i'm going to repeat something i said there but there are only so many ideas in the world you know. um, <laughs> Uh, but if Jesus thought, well, you know, on the cross, only six hours up here, then three days in the tomb, then off to eternity, yeah, why not? You know, I'll, I'll sign on for that. Seems a reasonable enough deal. You would, of course, never have been risen from the dead. Um, and all this, surely, what I've been talking about, is one reason, not very often advertised, for the so-called God debate. Um, because yet another irony is that just at the moment when a postmodern West appeared in the process of junking all of this rather embarrassing, high-flown metaphysical stuff, um, ideas which, again, ironically, had served the middle classes superbly well in their day, but no longer did so really, just at that point where all of this stuff about science and progress and Geist and reason and humanity seem so much embarrassing metaphysical baggage. Some Western thinkers, including that guy whose wife, um, some metaphysical thinkers felt the need to reach back into the previous history of the European middle classes, into the Enlightenment indeed, and come up with a rather sort of crude, you know, off the peg version of, of the great the great enlightenment, the great middle class enlightenment, so that old-fashioned 19th century rationalists like Richard Dawkins and the late Christopher Hitchens, with whom I used to dis uh, disseminate Trotsky's leaflets outside a car factory in Oxford many years ago, um, they may have, they do have other reasons for arguing against religion, some of them interesting, some perhaps not very interesting, but it's significant, I think, even so, in the larger context, that once again, we should be hearing the apparently clapped out language of reason, progress, science, and so on, at just the point where the West, confronted with radical Islam, seems in need of some rather more robust self-justification for its activities than postmodernism can provide it with. So it is that the American death of God thinker Sam Harris, despite his apparent belief that his people are the most morally upright ever to walk the earth, was prepared in the wake of 9-11 to consider a preemptive strike, preemptive strike against the Muslim world, resulting, if necessary, he said, in the deaths of tens of millions of innocent civilians. 
if it would prevent them from developing nuclear weapons. And Harris is a liberal. God knows what his more conservative colleagues are planning, you know. For, um, I should add, incidentally, that the 9-11 I'm referring to is, of course, the second 9-11. I don't mean, I'm not talking about the first, the first 9-11, which, as I'm sure you know, was when uh, the United States uh, uh, violently overthrew the democratically elected government of Salvador Allende in Chile and substituted for it an odious autocrat who went on to murder far more people than died in the World Trade Center. But you won't hear about that on Fox News either. Let me end with a final irony, which I touched on very briefly earlier on. Postmodernism harbors an ideology known as culturalism, um, namely the belief that when it comes to human beings, culture goes all the way down. Culture is wall to wall, so to speak. You couldn't, on this view, dig deeper than culture because the concepts and techniques and methods you would need to do so would themselves be cultural and therefore you couldn't stand as it were. You'd have to stand outside your own skin. What this means in effect is that culture becomes a new kind of foundation. Culture is the new foundation of a postmodern age. A shame-faced kind of foundation, to be sure. One that will not speak its name because it's anti-foundational. But to all intents and purposes, that's the way, one of the many ways, the concept of culture now operates. And this is as appropriate, as I say, to an age in which culture, among other things, means uh, what you will gladly kill people for. Um, so that the irony then is that one form of culturalism, <coughs> namely Western postmodernism, finds itself confronting another form of culturalism, which is religious fundamentalism. Because fundamentalism is certainly a culturalism of a sort. Fundamentalism is essentially a mistake about the nature of writing, a belief that signs can be frozen and fixed and arrested, whereas it's in the nature of a sign that that's not true about it, and if it could be, it wouldn't be a sign. But that's a different argument. Postmodernist culturalists aren't, of course, uh, prepared to slaughter for their beliefs because they don't tend to hold their beliefs, like A.J.P. Taylor, very vigorously in the first place. But they do tend to see culture quite rightly as a zone of conflict and contestation, as, of course, does religious fundamentalism. And that, looking at culture as, a, I mean, culture in the broad sense, not Balzac and Beethoven, that seeing it as a, for, as a zone of contestation and engagement it itself is a momentous development in the idea of culture in our time because um, it means that, cutting a long story short, it means that culture which used to be the kind of fundamental ground on which we could all meet in our common humanity, irrespective of our differences, and which, of which the arts were a supreme and tangible embodiment, because that idea is too abstract and it needs a tangible embodiment, and literature and the arts provided that. That ended, and it ended in the mid-20th century, that idea of culture ended in the mid-20th century with the emergence of the single most revolutionary movement of the modern age, not just of the 20th century, but of, the, of modernity itself. Not socialism, not feminism, not anarchism. Revolutionary nationalism, which in those mid-decades of the 20th century transformed the face of the earth, detaching one client state after another from the imperium, from the previous proprietors, as it were. And, what, and since nationalism is par excellence a form of cultural politics, the phrase cultural politics would be an oxymoron or self-contradictory phrase to the earlier idea of culture, where culture is set above the merely political. Cultural politics would be for that as much an oxymoron as, say, business ethics is an oxymoron. Now, <coughs> culture becomes part of the problem and not part of the putative solution. Um, culture had, had shed its innocence. It was no longer the opposite of politics, as it was by and large for the liberal humanist tradition, which was an enormously generous, 
hearted uh, and great spirited tradition as well as an ideologically uh, flawed one. But culture was now, for th almost for the first time, certainly in modernity, is a very language in which political demands were being framed and constituted and articulated and, and so on. However, despite that importance, one can't deny the importance of culture in that meaning of the word, it's still, for, a, for good old-fashioned materialists like myself, it still doesn't go all the way down and it's still not finally where it's at. None of the major problems faced by humanity today, I would wager, are specifically cultural in nature. Of course, in some rather vague and loose and rather useless sense of the word culture, all human problems are cultural. But they're actually material problems of disease and war and genocide and starvation and so on. In fact, dismally, they're very much the problems that we had on the eve of the first millennium. You know, not only the same. Um, the conflict between Islam, uh, uh, radical Islam, so-called Islamism, and advanced capitalism, for example, is of course not a cultural one. Basically, it's a, it's a political one. It certainly isn't a row about God or the immortality of the soul or anything as refined as that. The recent war in the country I live in between nationalists and unionists is very little to do with culture or religion. It expressed itself part of the time in religious terms, but it was an ethno-political war, not a religious or cultural one. The concept of culture needs to be deflated. I do so, I hope, in a little book, um, extraordinarily cheap and remarkably attractive and <laughs> grippingly readable, indeed utterly fascinating and coruscating little book that I've just published called Culture, would you believe it? Single, pregnant, terse word. That was the published as thought. I call it cultural introduction, but he thought that might confine it to a student audience, so he lopped off the phrase, an introduction, that's capitalism for you. Um, uh, if, uh, culture, put it this way, culture is something we need, but essentially we need it because of our material natures. We need it because of the kinds of animals we are, what Marx called our species being, or Gattungswesen. All human beings are prematurely born. We are all born prematurely. We are all born unable to take care of ourselves, helpless and vulnerable. You know, we can't just sort of get up, stagger to our feet, lick ourselves down and gallop off into the middle distance, you know, as, some, as other animals can. Animals who can do that are unfallen. That's very restrictive because the fall, of course, is a fall up not a fall down, it's Felix Cooper, it's fortunate fall. It's a tumble up into history and consciousness and language and all of those things that make our lives so exciting and simultaneously that make us so much more destructive than creatures who get up and stagger away, licking themselves down. The human animal is the one who is at once, you know, can produce, you know, Don Giovanni, as badgers and squirrels can't, unless they're being very furtive about it, or possibly doing it at night when we're not looking. You know. Who knows? But of course, our capacity for genocide and murder and abuse and exploitation is far greater than theirs. It is a fortunate fall. The creative and the destructive are sides of the same coin. Um, anyway, all human beings are born with a huge gap in their nature, which is where culture, in the sense of care, of kinship, of uh, nurture, has to be immediately, otherwise they will die. Culture, in that sense, is vital to our material existence. But what that means is that if we are cultural beings, it's because we're in the first place, as Thomas Aquinas might put it, lumps of matter of a peculiar kind. Whatever else human beings are, they are natural material objects. They are part of nature. And anything more sexy and glamorous they can get up to has to go on within a respect for those limits. And hubris, the virulently anti-material hubris of a certain American ideology, for example, which will see limit only as negative, 
only as constrictive and for which the spirit is potentially infinite. Nowhere but in the States does one hear the dreary mantra, I can be anything I want. No, you can't. You can't be a lump of cheese, for example. You can't be Brad Pitt, because fortunately only Brad Pitt can be Brad Pitt. Yeah? It's one of the gifts that God has given us. Um, uh, that whole deeply anti-bodily, anti-material hubris of the spirit, a lot to do with Puritanism and capitalism and so on. Anyway, what I'm saying is, if we wish to deflate the potential hubris of culture, which is rampant in our own day, we have to look, as tragedy has typically looked, to the poor, bare-forked creature, as King Lear has it, to the material nature and limitations of our being. And on that um, earnest and uplifting note, I think I will end. Thank you very much. Thank you. Eagleton, Terry, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for a, a daring lecture. Can I just ask you a first very simple question? Um, why are we talking about religion? Because your lecture sounds a bit like uh, a lecture on religion against its cultural despisers. And there might, might be all kinds of good reasons uh, to argue against people with flawed ideas of religion. But is there any positive sense, a positive reason to talk about religion nowadays? Well, I don't think, yes, I think there is. I mean, I don't think it's simply a matter of demolishing or trying to demolish naive or caricatured views of, uh, let's say, of the gospel. Um, oh, no, I think there are, there are indeed, for, and, and I hope some of that came through in my talk. There are more positive reasons for that. What, it, what I think is intriguing, and uh, what I don't fully understand, is the way that theology has become such an important discourse for the left recently, at least for some left intellectuals. One thinks of, you know, Zizek and Badiou and Habermas and a number of others. Um, it's very interesting that uh, previously, I mean, a left that previously really rather nothing but contempt for theology, you know, has, not least in the work of Zizek, has um, begun to grapple very seriously with it. I don't quite understand the historical roots of that, but I do think that one reason, perhaps, is that uh, whatever else you might think about theology, it's an arena in which the, the most profound questions can be posed such as, you know, why is there anything rather than nothing? It's hard to get a deeper question than that. Um, and what's happened, of course, in late capitalism is that the arena for raising fundamental questions, even intellectually, the public space for that has shrunk drastically. And I think that people like Badiou, who's written a marvellous book on St. Paul and who is a complete atheist, Zizek, who is an atheist, Habermas and so on, a number of others. I think one reason, perhaps, is that theology just is uh, an occasion for raising questions of fundamental import, which a narrowly utilitarian form of rationality has effectively expelled. So it provides a certain space, as it were, for that. So why, why isn't that the case with words like humanity or progress? And a materialist like yourself would be interested in material progress. So oh, why, I, why, why don't we do away with religion, swap it for your vanity, uh, and oh, that creates a I similar mean, space? I mean, there have been all kinds of attempts to do that. It's been tried. The religion of humanity, so-called, was a movement in Victorian England in the 19th century. Auguste Comte, George Eliot was part of that, yes? Um, the attempt to humanise and secularise theology um, as I began my talk by saying, has an enormously long, well not enormously long, but has a large history in modernity at least. Um, and um, I suppose um, one argument against that is first of all 
that the word humanity is by no means an unequivocally positive term, as the religion of humanity deludedly believed. You know, humanity is a kind of hurrah term, you know, essentially good and great and kindly. This is pre-Auschwitz, you know. Auschwitz is also humanity, yeah? Humanity at the end of its tether. Let's not have definitions of humanity which edit out these atrocities. Yeah? As I said before, the creative and the destructive in the species are almost inseparable. So I think that there was a sense that trying to reduce religion to, hu trying to humanize humanity, religion at once um, was a very partial notion of humanity and also was a kind of gentrifying, see? It brought otherness closer. It reduced it to us, and that's what we feel safe with. We like doing that. We don't like something that you know, comes, as it were, from some other kind of space. Um, so I think that's, that's one part of my answer to you. The other part about the question of progress, why not just have ideas of progress, is, of course, everybody believes in progress. You know, I mean, everybody believes in progress with a small p, it's just that they don't believe in progress with a capital P, yes? Which our Victorian, our 19th century forebears did, yes? Progress for them was, as it were, a metaphysical uh, dynamic built into the very nature of the stuff of the universe. A grand unfolding tale, thoroughly deterministic, in fact. It would happen whether we liked it or not, yes? It was a kind of secular providence in that way. Nobody believes that anymore. That idea lay dead in the rubble of the battlefields of the First World War, along with a lot of other posh ideas that served the early middle classes of Europe extraordinarily well in their time. But that doesn't mean to say that those of us who dislike the idea of progress with a capital P refuse anaesthetics when we go to the dentist. Yes? Of course everybody believes in progress, not least, of course, as I said, Marx is on dying praise for the way in which capitalism in a few brief centuries had revolutionized human history, sweeping away the repressions of the ancien regimes. You know? Well, almost entirely, it overlooked a few remnants like Prince Charles, for example. <laughs> How you can overlook somebody with ears like that, I find almost <laughs> impossible to imagine. Um, but, of course, you know, everybody believes in progress. It's just progress that is under question in an age of two world wars, of the camps, <clears throat> and so on. Well, so you see, I, I do find your criticisms of movements in the past or streams of thoughts in the past very convincing, or even your criticism of the years of Prince Charles. Um, but at some point in your lecture you said, religion is in need of a robust self-justification. And postmodernity is not going to give that. So I wonder no. what that robust self-justification okay. no, no, is. No, no, with respect, I didn't say that. Sorry. I said that the West, Western civilization is in need ah, of okay. a more robust self-justification than pragmatism, relativism, individualism, etc. Yes. So is religion that, that robust self-justification? Well, it depends on what you do with it and what you mean by it, doesn't it? I mean, the scandal, of course, is that you can reduce absolutely anything to ideology. You can turn anything in the world into an instrument of oppressive power. And if you can turn the, the, the Christian gospel, the New Testament, into that, then you can turn anything into it. And that's been the sad and sordid tale, or one tale, of the history of, of Christianity. I mean, utterly scandalous and mind-blowing, you know that uh, to uh, the, the, the figure who, who a low-life itinerant who gets up the nose of the establishment and is done away with by being crucified. Don't, let's, not, let's remember crucifixion was always used by the Romans as for political offences. I mean, we don't know whether the Romans actually believed that Jesus was a political rebel. Probably not. But they certainly pretended they did. Crucifixion was used for political reasons. You were pinned up on the edge of the city as a warning to other potential dissidents, mainly zealots, 
you try it on, this is what you'll get. Crucifixion is a sign, it's a semiotic, it's an advertisement as well as a atrocious pain, yes? Now, um, the fact that you can turn that, somebody who gets done in by the powers that be for speaking up for the dispossessed, yes? Um, the fact you can turn that into the grotesquerie of, say, American evangelicalism is just so unutterably scandalous and mind-blowing that it's hard to absorb. But you can, because it's happened. But, of course, of course, theology is not confined to that. There's still, I think, the possibility of theology being askew to that setup in interesting and productive ways. And that's what some of my own recent work, but not just mine, has actually tried to do. So what's the, what's the cure, if there is a cure? Well, How it, do we prevent... Well, first of all, one can't happen. answer questions like that in five seconds. That's an impossible question. And secondly, I've been trying to talk for an hour about those issues. <laughs> and thirdly, I've published several books on it. So let's have another, que so let's have another question instead. You know, like I'll have another question. About the I'll weather. Have question about the you. weather or something. Is that, no, not about the weather, but okay. about postmodernity. So some people would say that postmodernity comes forth from a similar political criticism that you're suggesting by saying, let's do away with the grand narratives. And then there is a new space and a new sense of the divine. And postmodernity has made that happen. But you seem to disagree. Well, well I don't that. think you know, that the issue of grand narratives is an issue of intellectual choice. Like some people like grand narratives, you know, old fashioned dinosaur like Marxists, for example, whereas other cooler and more trendy people don't. You know, we're not talking here about some kind of cerebral choice. We're talking about things like the World Trade Center. We're talking about actual history. We're talking about what are the historical conditions in which people start getting embarrassed by grand narratives or don't think of themselves in those terms, and under what conditions do actual, real, murderous grand narratives start up. Yes? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not a matter of, you know, do you prefer cabbage to cauliflower? It's a matter of, of actual history. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't link together postmodernism creating that kind of space and the divine. Mm. I didn't say anything about the divine and postmodernism. In fact, postmodernism, I mean, there is a kind of postmodern theology, of course, of course. But again, I mean, um, that's another example of the way in which even in, as it were, a society which regards itself as thoroughly post theological and post-secular, post-modernism itself can become material for a certain theology. Sure. So before I go to the audience, uh, so you can start preparing your questions, uh, let me ask you one more question about your um, materialism that you ended with. I mean, if we are animal, if we are lumps of matter, doesn't that, doesn't that make us perceptive to... Uh, the manipulation of capitalism. Yes, yes. If we were angels, we probably wouldn't be. Yes, absolutely. It's because we have bodies that we can be vulnerable. We can be oppressed and exploited. Yes, and also because we have minds and minds are able to exploit. Minds can figure out extremely ingenious ways of exploiting other people. So the fact that we are embodied people and... Um, uh, um, so reflective people it ha has, has much to do, you're quite right, fundamentally with the fact that human beings can exploit each other in the ways that, as far as we can see, spiders can't. So once again, they may be very, being very furtive about it. Um, actually, maybe there's a whole class of enslaved spiders, you know, and a ruling class among spiders, but we do, as far as we can see, that's not true. Let me just put the point another way as far as bodies go. By the way, you know, I always give my postgraduate students one piece of advice. If you're going to publish a book, make sure you have the word body in the title. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, it just won't get published. In my day, it was dialectics. <laughs> Let me just give you an example of materialism, if I may. And I draw it not from Karl Marx, but from Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas would have believed, I think in the disembodied, in the existence of the disembodied soul of Michael Jackson, had he been misfortunate enough to be acquainted with 
the phenomenon of Michael Jackson. But he most certainly would not have believed that the disembodied soul of Michael Jackson was Michael Jackson. Aquinas most certainly wouldn't have believed that. Mm -hmm. Aquinas' identity is corporeal. It's about the resurrection of the body. It's about the survival of the soul. So yes, in a sense, Aquinas believed that Michael Jackson sort of standing by to be resurrected in some mysterious fashion, you know, which will be a, his latest transformation. Gone through a great many in his life. He'll go through another. But Aquinas would certainly not have believed that to be out of one's body is to be oneself. For Aquinas were animals all the way through, not just from the, from the neck down, were, were animals all the way through. Um, God is an animal, the word made flesh. Yeah? And any God who isn't animal, who doesn't have an animal presence in existence, has nothing to do with us. Or as my friend Herbert McCabe once put it, if heaven doesn't involve my body, it doesn't involve me. Yeah? So there's a thoroughgoing materialism, in my view, at the root of Christianity. Notice that most of the time, if you open the gospel rather randomly, what Jesus is up to is not praying or some kind of sacred activity. He doesn't actually seem to give sacrifice, which is interesting for a pious Jew. He's curing people of bodily ailments. You know, you open the gospel, that's probably what you'll find he's doing. And what, what happens when he does that? He never once counsels anybody to reconcile themselves to their illness or sickness. He never once says, you know, accept this burden and you'll have a greater life in the future. That kind of ideological garbage, yes, which is peddled so much by so many pious people today. Jesus regards illness as part of the power of Satan, which of course was a common belief in his day. Mm -hmm. You know, this woman whom the devil has bound and so on. Um, and um, therefore, as his adversary, and of course the word Satan in the Hebrew Scriptures is a word for God. It means accuser or adversary, and it's those who like to see God as patriarch and big daddy and superego. Why do we like to see God like that? Because we like being punished. That's why. Because it relieves us of our guilt. If you're going to have a God, you might as well have a real, a real big bastard of a God. You know, not some, you know wimpish guardian reading, you know, liberal, you know, God. Who wants a God like that? Yes? Well, the Jews don't, certainly. They want a nice big bastard of a God. Yeah? And so do we. Yeah? And uh, God infuriatingly refuses to play the game. He says, look, um, I'm flesh and blood. I'm, I'm fellow victim. You know, I'm not the judge. I'm counsel for the defense. I'm there with you in the dock. Yeah. Well, nobody wants a God like that. Yeah. Um, Satan is one image of God, a very, very powerful one, because it's a super egoic image of God. Super ego draws its roots from the id, from the unconscious, and for Freud is terrifyingly powerful. It will drive us literally to death if we allow it to. Yeah. Um, and you can build a whole theology out of that, and, and lots of people do. Lots of people believe in a Satan, satanic God. They, they don't think he's satanic, they think he's very holy. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.